Stay tuned for the latest message from Pastor Kevin Anthony. We give God the glory. He's an amazing God. Amen. In Jesus' name. We were looking at the life of Elisha. Amen. Before he stepped into his fullness uh, or in his in his fully into his office as a prophet. We were looking at his before he went into that uh, journey or before he was on his own. God used him in that place. He had to take a journey, a small uh, trip. Last journey with, with Elijah. Amen. He went to four different places. And we are also doing the same trip with them. We are also on the same journey. Are you with me on that journey? Going to Gilgal. Uh, then going to Jerusalem. And then from Jerusalem we are going to a Jordan. And then from Jordan we are going somewhere. Is that the journey we are on? Is that the bus going to that place? No. Where is the bus going? Uh? It's going to Gilgal. And the next stop in after Gilgal is uh, Bethany. Bethel. Uh, Bethel. Okay, I thought Bethany. And after Bethany? Bethel. Uh, after Bethel? Jericho. Jericho. And after Jericho? Jericho. Amen. We we're looking at... Uh, how's your bigger picture going on, by the way? I like the way the children are responding to this word. They seem to be more active with that word. Somebody just said awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, how's the bigger picture? Oh, you, you remember bigger picture or you've forgotten the bigger picture? <laughs> Where is your concentration? On the bigger picture or the rear view mirror? The rear view mirror is just for reference. It is just to give a check and then move forward. But the main concentration or the main focus is on the bigger picture. Amen. Don't miss, look at somebody, don't miss the bigger picture. Are you with me? Do not miss the bigger picture. And often enough you'll always see, you'll always come across this as... Uh, <coughs> The enemy will always want to remind you of your past. And often enough, he will always want to scare you, showing that was left long time back behind. Hallelujah. At the same time, don't keep your focus on your past victories. That's finished. It's our work. Go forward. New grounds to cover. Amen. New battles to win. New, new challenge to take up and overcome. Are you with me, church? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because God is progressive. He's a progressive God, always moving forward. Are you with me, church? Look at somebody and say, look at the bigger picture. Don't look at the rear view mirror and drive your car all the time. You need to look at the bigger window. Rather the small window that is pointing something that has gone past. That's what you're learning about Gilgal. Gilgal is something to do with your past. It's finished. It's over. Move on. Move on to where God is taking you to the next level. That's what the Bible talks about from going from glory to glory. Strength to strength. From one level to another level. Hallelujah. Don't be satisfied at the level that you are in. Move to the next level. Are you with me, church? Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many of you all had the chance in Abu Dhabi? Uh, to do the assignment between looking and studying the life of Elijah and Elisha. How many miracles did Elijah, Elijah perform? Or how many miracles that were associated with Elijah? Oh, nobody in Abu Dhabi. Wow, I'm surprised. Take a wild guess. You didn't count. How many guess? How many? How many? Now you can count in your mind. Da, 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 da. Twelve is Elijah. No, Elijah, Elijah. How many? How? Okay, Elijah is six. Uh, Elisha. <laughs> so easy, right? No need to count. Come on, double. That's a double. Just double it out. If this guy was 10, the other guy is 20. How many of you think it is six? Okay, just one person gave me the answer. Two people just gave me the answer. Six. Okay, go back and read the Bible again. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> I like that the side note. The side note was so far. Now there's definitely uh, Elijah. Elijah's uh, I'm not going to give you the answer though. Elijah the miracle that was worked in him and through him is double digit. So it's not single digit. And the miracles worked in and through Elisha, you find out whether it is actually double or no. Elijah's entry, Elijah's introduction was a miracle itself. You remember? The introduction of Elijah was a miracle by itself. Are you with me? So check out the miracles that was associated with each one of them. In them or through them. They are not to be separated. I told you, look at the miracle that God worked in them and through them. And for just to give you the, uh, give you a heads up on that, Elijah had a double digit. Miracles worked in and through him. So please don't just uh, read it through. Don't just ignore it. What happens are more, most of the time the focus is on the bigger miracles because that's what is often spoke up, spoken about in the churches. But look at the other miracles that actually God did in their lives. Either was it through the word of knowledge, word of prophecy. Look at the, and how it came to fulfillment. Are you with me? While I speak about Elijah's uh, introduction started with a miracle. I also want to say that Elisha's death also finished off with a miracle. While we talk about Elijah, that he started off on a note which was a miraculous note. At the same time, the end of Elisha, his disciple, it ended in death, but it ended with a miracle. Do you, did anybody go to Elijah, Elisha's death so far? Yes. What was the Elisha's death? What miracle was that? Who rolled over to whose grave? <laughs> Who's that guy? Who, how the guy roll over? Like panda rolling over? <laughs> so what rolling over are we talking about? Yeah, completed. What was it? Yeah, you're saying something. Rolling over what? Elijah's death. Elisha's death. Grave. Elisha's grave. Okay. Fill in the blanks. Yes, Sam. Somebody died and they opened up the tomb of Elisha and lowered the dead body and it touched the dead body of Elisha and he came back to life. Right? Even in his death there was a miracle. Correct? Even in his death there was a miracle. But even in that death, there was a miracle in that place. Hold a minute. There is a message even in that. Elisha's dead body raised up somebody to life. That means Elisha had potential to perform one more miracle before his death. Did you see that? There was still potential in that Elisha before dying to perform one more miracle that a death brought to life back again. There are times that we have the similar kind of issue. We have the potential but it dies off. We're going to pray. You will lift your full potential. Now, Elisha died and yet the Bible says a dead body he was raised back. It simply says that there was still one more uh, potential to, to perform a miracle. One more, that dead body. Look at that thing in that way, that there was still one more miracle still locked in his body and that his death performed it. If he was alive, he could have performed that one more. I want you to pray for your own self that you will live to the full potential that God has invested his power inside of you. Your potential will not die with you. Come on, are you with me, church? You will not take a potential and go to the grave. Hallelujah. Till they lowered the dead body in that place, nobody knew there was still one more potential for a miracle in that place. Hallelujah. Don't go into the grave and find out that you still had a potential there. Are you with me, church? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, coming back to that assignment, uh, find out how many was Elijah and how many was Elijah. Please, I'll tell you, be inquisitive. Be a good student. Make your own rough notes and write down. It will help you. Don't just count it on the fingers. Yes, the day will come you will be able to count on your fingers. 
You'll be able to go through the journey just like that. But till such time, write down your notes. Be inquisitive and write down, oh, this one is Sony Miracle, write it down. Elisha, oh, right side, left side, put it in a comparison. And you'll be surprised, actually, there is actually, it's almost, it, not almost, it is double. What he had asked, he received that. But in order to know how much was the double figure, you need to know what was the single figure of Elijah. So it's, a, it's an amazing journey. Please, I would encourage you, go home and read it. Take your time, read, read uh, the, 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 these uh, uh, stories. It's very nice. It's very encouraging. It is, uh, it's amazing how God spoke to them and how God spoke through them and how those words came to fulfillment. Are you with me? Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. We, we looked at Gilgal. We'll look at Bethel. What is Bethel? Gilgal signifies separation. Gilgal separ signifies uh, rolling away. Gilgal signifies overcoming the flesh. While well, we talk about uh, the next one is, uh, is Bethel. They do not stay in Bethel for the rest of their lives. There were other things to overcome. And that's where we, anybody heard this word Bethel? Who was the word, who, where was it used for the first time in the Bible ever? The word Bethel. Who was the one who, who, who uh, uh, where it was mentioned in the Bible? Abraham, go to Genesis chapter 12. I've already spoken to you. I'll just touch some few points which I do not share. And we'll move forward to see what Bethel can do or what Bethel is supposed to be doing in our life. How you tap into the thing about Bethel. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Abraham came to that part of his life. There was no father in his life. Because all along, even though he was married... Even though he was a mature man, even though he was a wise man, even though he was somebody who was given into business, he was, he was always somebody who looked up to his father. He never took decisions on his own, even though he was married. Wherever the father went, he went. What father turned right, he would turn right. Turn left, turn left. Stay in one place, stay in one place. He did not have his, uh, his own voice. He just moved where his father moved. But he came to that stage in life, father passed away. And he was all by himself. When he was all by himself, God visited him another time. And he said, I will be a father to you. I will lead you from, from here on. I will guide you. Just stay with me, he said. Just stay with me and I will lead you. I will take you to the place that you will possess for your own self. I'll give you a promised land. Go to verse number five. And Abraham took his wife, Sarai, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered. And the souls that they had begotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Shechem. Unto the oak of Morai. Or More. And the Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And they are built, and there he built an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And removed from there unto a mountain on the east of what? Bethel. And pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Look at verse number 9. And it was still continuing. And what did he do? He pitched his tent there. But he continued his journey. Are you with me church? He continued his journey to a place called Negev. Negev means what? Anybody remembers what is Negev? Negev. Negev. The English translation is south. But what does Negev mean? Negev means dry. Negev means dry. He met God. He met God. God appeared to him. God gave him the word. God spoke to him. And then that place was what? Bethel. That's the place he built an altar. That's the place that he had a, 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 an, an encounter with God. And that's the place God gave him the promise. That's the place that God spoke to him. I will bless you. I will take care of you. I will keep take care of your seed. I will bless you. I will give you this land. Just stay. 
And what does this man do? Rightly so. He pitches his, be uh, he pitches his tent. By the way, he's not making an ordinary kind of... He pitches his tent. He's there. For those of the days, those people, if they moved one place, no, they would pitch their tent. They would have their house there. They would pitch there. And he pitched right beside Bethel. Now, when he is pitched his tent, he should have continued to stay there. But the Bible says this man takes a journey down south to a place called dryness. And he done, then after that, he does not stay in the place of dryness. He does not stay in the place of Negev. The Bible says what? And verse number 10. And he says what? And there was a famine in the land and Abraham went up or went down. He went down to Egypt thinking he's going to find it green. He's going to find green pasture. Thinking it's going to be like greener on the other side. Thinking like, oh, everything is going to be fine here. Hallelujah. Are you with me, church? The word of God says, woe unto those people, woe unto the man, woe unto those people who go down to Egypt for help. Egypt signifies world. Hallelujah. Where did the Lord give him a word? It was in that place when he met him in, uh, when he met him in Bethel, where he pinched the tent, where he raised an altar. That's a place God told him, I'll take care of you. I will bless you. I will bless your seed. I will bless your work. I will bless you. And this man takes his journey down south and then goes further down, slips down to Egypt. Now, what does Negev mean? Now, the word Negev, I told you, I'm not talking about the meaning of Negev. What does it signify? He says what? Well, he does not slip down to Egypt straight away. He stays in between for some time and then he slips down. Now, what do you think is the New Testament word for something in between? He's in Bethel. He's moved not to Egypt straight away. He's moved somewhere in Bethel and then he slips down to Egypt. The New Testament gives a word to it to some, for somebody who is in between. What is that word in between? Lukewarm. Lukewarm. That's what happens. You just don't suddenly become cold. You just suddenly suddenly don't uh, disappear. It all begins with slowly. You're neither up, neither are you down. Or you're here also and here also. Well, I'm close to Bethel. Well, I'm close to this also. Are you with me, church? When you take a journey down south, when you take a journey down south, away from Bethel, when you move away from the presence of God, it is not immediately one becomes cold or just is lost. It all starts in between. You are neither here, neither there. Or you are here also and here also. But there is a glimpse of grace in this place. There is a glimpse of grace in this place. The Bible says immediately he lands in trouble because he's journeying this is this land. And the Bible says that he told his wife, you make sure you call yourself, not my wife, my sister. Because she was pretty looking. And uh, uh, sure enough, he landed in trouble because Pharaoh even looked at his wife and immediately took her home. And that put him into trouble. But look at the grace of God. God shook off Pharaoh and said, don't touch this one. This one is not his sister, but this one is his wife. Don't touch. Well, I'll shake you up. Long story short, he goes to Abraham and says, Why did you do this to us? Please pack your back. Please go back where you came from. Please go. Don't put me in trouble. Are you with me, church? Go to chapter 13, verse 1. And Abraham, verse 1. And Abraham went up out of, it doesn't say he went out of Egypt. He says went up. Out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him into Negev. Abraham was very rich in cattle and in silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from Negev even unto where? Where did he come back again? To Bethel, to the house of God. He came back to the place where he had an encounter with God. He came back to the place where he received the word. He came back to that place and then he says what? Uh, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I. It's no shame to go back to basics where you met God first. Where you started your journey, where God met you and you started your journey with him. Look at this man. He received grace. He drifts away from that into the world. But listen, grace is chasing him there also. Grace will chase you down. Grace, will that's the beauty of the word of God. That's the beauty of the, the grace of it will chase you. 
But while it is chasing you, the Bible says, he turned back to the Lord. It was not compulsion. But the Bible says, he turned back up unto Bethel. And then he does what? And unto the place of the altar. Listen, that's what, what did I say? Altar is what? Consecration. He came back to the place of sacrifice. He came back to the place where he was consecrated. He came to that place of consecration, which he had made at first. And Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the beauty of Bethel. That God always speaks in that place. I want you to turn your Bibles to uh, chapter 28. Same, same book, chapter 28. We'll look at another th thing and pick up what are the keys that you and I can pick up while we talk about this journey from going from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho uh, to, uh, to Jordan. While we look into it, how do you tap into the anointing? How do you really tap into the, 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 the anointing and the presence of God? Chapter 28. Just open Bibles there and just leave it. There's another man who had an encounter with God and it was in Bethel. You remember this guy called Jacob? Yeah, his name was what? Fraud. The mother and father named him fraud. Then the mother and father named him cheat. Mother and father named him deceiver, supplanter. That was his name, Jacob, that's what his name was. Every time they called on his name, hey cheat, come here. Hey fraud, come here. Hey mischievous guy, prankster. That's how Jacob meant. He deceived his own father and took away the blessings. He was not the firstborn, he was the second one, though they were twins. Esau, by default, should have got the blessings coming from the dad. But he deceived his father and took away, stole away all that blessings. He tricked Esau to sell his birthright. Being the elder one, he had that thing. But he, he, he pushed him into such a place that he took away, snatched that birthright. And he came to that part of his life when he stole away the blessings of Esau. Now he was on his run to go to Haran. Because his mother said, escape, other you die. You have, must have got all the inheritance, you must have got all the blessing. But if there is no life, it's useless. Hallelujah. People may have lifestyle, but if they don't have life, it is useless. A youth church. He may have all the lifestyle of that inheritance, but if there is no life, it's useless. Lifestyle is of no useless. Is of no use. So he ran. Now, when he was running away from that place, there was an encounter that he had. Go to verse number ten. And Jacob went out from Beersheba, Beersheba, and went to Haran. He came to a place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. He took stones off of that place. And put them for his pillows. And lay, de, uh, and lay down in that place to sleep. He dreamt. And behold the ladder set upon the earth. And top of it reached to heaven. And behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold the Lord stood above it. And said I am the Lord God of Abraham. Thy father and the God of Isaac, the land where you lie, to thee I will give it, and to your seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be what? Blessed. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you in all places, not few places, all places to which you go. And I will bring you again into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken of thee to you. Look what a powerful word that is. God is saying, whatever I have spoken, whatever I have promised, I will make sure that I bring it to fulfillment. Everything. He says what? I have done which I, until I have done all that I have spoken to thee of. Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. 
And Jacob arose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put for pillows, set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon it. And he called on the name. He he called the name of that place what? He called that name what? Bethel. But he but the name of that city was called Luz at first. Hallelujah. Are you with me, church? This is the first time that he had an encounter with God. Now, when he had an encounter with God, do you think God spoke to him? He spoke to him, right? You spoke to him? Yeah? Don't close this. Go to fast forward. Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. Now between 28 and 35, a lot of things happened. He fell in love. Got married a couple of times. Yeah? He had a battery of children. He served his father-in-law for many, many, many years, more than two decades, cheated. What goes, what, 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 what goes around also comes back, right? What goes around comes back. Just the way he was, now it began to bite him because his father-in-law was cheating him with his wages, with his salary. He was cheating him and he cheated him many number of times. Now he came to that point, he said, I'm fed up, I need to go back home. And he picks up all his family, wives, children, everybody, livestock. I said, let's go home. And he comes back home. You remember the story I told you about? He had uh, a wrestling thing with, with the Lord, with the angel of the Lord. And when the angel of the Lord was uh, about to leave, he said, I will not leave you unless you bless me. And he touched the hollow of this thigh and he went out of joint for the rest of his life. He limped. You remember that thing? He came to his brother Esau. And Esau, the Bible says, he was no more angry. He received him, he embraced him, he forgave him. He said, listen, I don't need your riches because that's how he thought he'll appease him. He will, you know, quieten him down by giving him this livestock and all that. So he said, no, 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 keep it for yourself. God has blessed me. I have enough for myself. And they patched up. It was an amazing story, an amazing uh, end, ending there. But when that ending happened, it did not, the story did not end there. It went forward. It went forward there. Go to chapter 35, verse 1. See what does it say. Chapter 35, verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and do what? And dwell there. And make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Straight away, jump to verse number 6. Verse number 6. So Jacob, what did he do? He came to where? Luz. Which is in the land of Cain. That is Bethel. He and all his people were with him. And he built an altar unto the Lord and called that place El Bethel. That means God over the house of God. Okay? El Bethel. El Bethel. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What does Bethel means? Beth means house. El means God. House of God. As they continued with this Bethel for a long time, there arose a wicked king. I'm just going a little off from here. There is a wicked king who arose. His name was Jeroboam. He dropped El and he kept it Beth, just house, and messed the whole thing. He messed it royally and uh, what do you call, he brought an idolatry that made Israel to sin. He was a wicked, wicked king, very, very wicked king. He was an idolater and he forced it on people. And God uh, raised up somebody. He raised up another king who restored back Beth to Bethel. Find out who that guy is. Uh, his name was Josiah. Josiah, when he rose up to be the king, the first thing he did was he put these things back into its place. Whatever Jeroboam had erected, whatever Jeroboam had brought into Ethel, he burnt it down. So much of the Bible says he powdered it. He destroyed. And he restored back what belonged there. Because this guy put all his idols in high places with his brother. Go to verse number 7. And what did he say? He built this place called Bethel where God had appeared to him. He says where he fled from the face of his brother. Verse number 9. And God appeared unto Jacob again and he came to came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God sent to him, your name is Jacob. Remember the first place God changed his name? Yeah. He's reminding him of again. 
He said, your name is no longer, be, is, is, your name is Jacob, but your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be a name. And he called him what? He called his name what? Israel. Right? You remember the beginning of the service, what was a generation, the genealogy? Yeah, you remember? When it was mentioned another time, what was mentioned? Jacob or Israel? When God rewrites the history, he doesn't think of the past. He doesn't bring the past back. Because that was a word. You no longer be called Jacob. That means he's not going to talk about it. Are you with me, church? When he himself said, you will not be known by that former name. You will be known by a new name. When the thing was written, he spoke it as what? Israel. Go to the next verse. And God said unto him, look at verse number 11. What did God say unto him? What did God say to him? And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. You remember this word, this name Almighty? What is Almighty by the way? El Shaddai. What is El Shaddai? We, we, rang, uh, we, 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 we went through this journey, right? You remember God meeting Abraham and he said, I am what? Almighty. El Shaddai. What is El Shaddai? The one who is fruitful. One who makes fruitful. The all bountiful one. The all sufficient one. El Shaddai. So look at God telling him, I am El Shaddai. I am the Lord your God, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and what? Multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come out of you. Wow. Not just nation, but a company of nations. Amen. Then he says what? Kings shall come out of your loins from your belly. Go to the next verse. She says what? The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I will give you. And to your seed, after thee, I will give the land. Hallelujah. And God went up from him in that place where he did what? Talked to him. Go to verse 15. And Jacob called the name of that place where God spoke to him as what? What did God, Jacob name that place? Bethel. Bethel, where he had an encounter with God, the house of God. Now tell me, in chapter 28 and chapter 35, God spoke to him, right? In Bethel, right? What do you think in one word? What do you think God was speaking? What do you think God was releasing? One word, God was giving him. In Bethel, when he had an encounter with God, God released something. He received from the Lord something, one word. Sorry? Blessing, another word. What did he receive? Look at verse number 11. What did he say? What do you think it was? What is verse number 11? What do you think it was? Verse number 11, verse number 12, all are same. What do you think was he receiving from, the, from, from God? He says what? The land which I give you, that was given to Isaac, that is given to, uh, to, to Abraham, I will give you. And to your seed, I will give you this land. In the previous verse also, God was, there is one line or there is one word that ties all the verses together. Do you see a promise there? In Bethel, God released his promise. Let me push it further. When God gave the word in Genesis 28, God gave him the promise. There was no need for God to repeat it one more time when he met in Bethel the second time. What does that mean? Renewal of promise. The first time God promised him, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. When he met him again, the next time again in Bethel, God renewed that promise. Hallelujah. Are you with me, church? There are times that God gives you, listen, there are times when we receive the word of God, we receive the promise, sometimes we forget it. We have just like, maybe, maybe not, not sure. But listen, when God, when, when, when you and I have an encounter with God, when you walk with God, be, be, be ready that God will renew His covenant. He will remind you of His promise. When He had His renewed encounter with God, God also renewed His promise back to Him. And then He added, King shall come out of your loins. Nation and company of nations shall come out of you. So when you are in the presence of God, when you are you're having your Bethel moment, when you are having your Bethel encounter, expect promises. Amen. Come on, are you with me church? When you are in your Bethel moment, so when you are going through the Bethel journey, when you are going through that, don't take it just as, as, as just, uh, oh Bethel. No, no, Bethel is where God speaks. We'll look at verse 15. Where God spoke to him, he called that place what? what? Bethel. That means God speaks. God spoke to Abraham when he was in Bethel. Hallelujah. God speaks and he allows us to speak back to him. It's not one way. It's a communication. That's why I said in Bethel there is communication. In Bethel it is not one-sided monologue. No. 
It is a dialogue. It's an exchange. Are you with me, church? There's an exchange happening. See, when God is speaking, it's a good thing. Fine. It is nothing to worry. But it is a concern. It's real worry when he's on mute button. When God goes on a silent mode, is dangerous, by the way. Sometimes, voice, when you speak loudly, certain things cannot be heard very clearly. But you know one thing? Silence speaks louder than words. Have you had a situation at home? When it is silence, how it is screaming? Sometimes it is chilling. Sometimes it is very, you feel very uncomfortable. Come on, guys. Silence. When there is silence in the house, you, everybody comes to there is some uncomfortable situation there. It's the same thing when you find that God has not, when God is stopped speaking, it is there for us to draw our attention to Him. Why is quiet? Hallelujah. Are you with me, church? Let's go back to our, 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 our dinner tables. Let's go back to our, our time of fellowship at home. The time somebody is not speaking in the house, is it a comfortable situation for all of us? Sometimes, I'll use our own kids, our, my own kids in the house. Sometimes, you know, you give them a rap, two minutes and they'll come back again. But the time when we say, mom will say, I'm not going to speak to you. That is not, listen, it's a very uncomfortable situation for them. They're fish out of water. They will do anything and everything just to get your attention to just say, please talk to me. It's very difficult for them. Have you guys tried it at home? It's a tried and tested product, my friend. If you have not tried, try it at home. Sometimes WAC does not do that much of a trick. It does not have that great desired results. But silence does, my friend. Big time. Big time. It does a big time. Because they'll find it very uncomfortable. They will stop jumping. They will stop playing. Because, oh, dad, mom is upset. Just they stop talking. They, I'll always find them in and around me. Somewhere in around me, trying to get my attention, trying to get the mother's attention, like, please, yeah, please talk to me. You can whack me, but don't stop talking to me. Silence is sometimes killer, by the way. It is killer. You'll see the concern on the children's face when mom and dad go on soft. Uh, forget mom and dad, husbands and wives also, my friend. <laughs> it's a fact. We laugh about it. We may think, we may try to cover. Listen, that's a fact of the matter. It is not the truth of the matter. It is the fact of the matter. Facts change. Truth does not change. Silence can be broken, by the way. Silence is not permanent. The point that I want to drive, when there is silence around, it's a very uncomfortable situation. When silence is around and it's screaming in your face, then it's a matter of concern. That's exactly what happens in Bethel. If you're meeting God and there is a silence on His part. See, when God is speaking, He'll always, it's nice. Even if it's a rebuke, at least he knows you're speaking to you, man. Imagine he goes on mute button. It's not a comfortable situation. You know, for Majuna is maturing. So if I don't speak for some time, he'll say it's okay. He'll just go the other side. But the other small one, she'll be running around. And if I'm like that, she'll put her face down, try to knead, finger me, do something. Why? She wants my attention back. She wants the relationship to be stored back. Listen, some of you may be going through a silent mode with God. Do jumping around around Him. Listen, when, when you are on a silent mode, children will give you an extra hug. Even if you don't ask, they'll give you, my friend. They want to give you an extra kiss. They want to just do something. Listen, at that point in time, you can get any work done. Why? They want that Noise to be restored back. The voice to be restored. Am I making some sense, church, here? If it means for you to draw the attention of God, if He's gone on silent mode, just do what He wants you to do. I'm talking reality, right? Am I talking planet Earth? This is what it is. And listen, when they do that, you just want to embrace them. You don't show away your children. You don't show away your spouse at that point in time when the silence is broken, when the thing has gone back to you just embrace them, right? If we, the Bible says, if we being wicked, if we being human, we know how to relate to our children, we just embrace them, we just want to hug them. How about God? How about Him? 
He's a father. If we have a father's heart, it's simply because he is a father. Hallelujah. Listen, check it out. In Bethel, is God on the silent mode? Is he put a mute button to his thing and like zip it up? Don't talk. Don't speak. No, hold a minute. Shake him. Hallelujah. Are you with me, church? Shake him up a little bit. Listen, he's sovereign. When I say shake him up, get into his lap. Do all kinds of jumping around here around because he's God. But at the same time, he's a father. Hallelujah. Now, did you see a promise in this place? In the place of Bethel, God speaks. In the place of Bethel, when you have the Bethel moment, he communicates. Not just only words, even silence can communicate, like I said. So find out why is the silence. Now, if you see, go to verse number one. Go to verse number one, same chapter. Same chapter, 35. Look at what he said. And God told him, pick yourself up and go back to the place of Bethel where I first met you. In that verse, verse number one, and God spoke to him and says, pick yourself up. And he says what? He spoke to Jacob and he said, arise, go to Bethel and dwell there. Did he tell his, bring your family also? He did not. But the next following verses say that what? He told his wives, he told his children, he told his entire household and all those people were under him, with him. Pack your bags, we are going to Bethel. Earlier when he had the encounter, he was all by himself. Only an, an, a, guy, a guy who has a Bethel encounter, a God encounter, can influence everybody else. Because you know what happens in Bethel. Come on, am I with you, church? He knows what happens in Bethel. He could have easily gone and said, y'all stay here, I'm going to Bethel. But no, he chooses what? To take his entire family. When you have your Bethel moment, don't be alone. Maybe first time you're alone. Maybe you have the first time you have a uh, taste of what, mean, what it means to be in Bethel. Listen, a time will come. A time will come that you no longer want to go on. You'll take along along with you, your family. Take along your fa wife. Take along your children. Take along your household. You take along people along with you where? To that place. He didn't ask, God didn't ask him to come. Uh, bring along. But he took. Now when he took, he told something. What did he tell them? What did he tell them? He says what? Go to the next verse. He says what? Verse number two. Jacob told his household. Look at what he said. Not just his family. Entire household. And all that were with him. Put away what? Your strange gods. That are among you. And then he says what? Be clean and change your garments. Listen. In Bethel there is purification. Amen. In Bethel if there is promise. Then in Bethel there is also purification. He said you may come with me. I'm not taking you for a joy ride. I'm taking you for something nice. It's, going to be, it's something that is going to be life impacting. It's going to be change. But at the same time he says what? You cannot come the way you are. He says what? There is purification. Well, thank God today of, for the blood of Jesus. It restores us back to the place of Bethel. It restores us back to the place we are supposed to be in his presence. Are you with me church? It is the blood of Jesus. The purification is still there. The purification is there. Thank God for the provision that is there for us today. The blood of Jesus. That we can come and have an encounter with God. And he says it is not just one time encounters. It can be many encounters. The Bible says what next verse? He says strange, but next verse. He says, what does it say? And he says what? Arise, go to Bethel and build an altar. Uh, 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 let us build an altar unto God who answered me in the day of distress for, uh, and was with me in the way which I went. Next verse. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange God that were in their hand and all their earrings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Look at what he says. These guys... Only a changed man can influence, uh, influence another change. Because they saw that guy, Jacob, was not the same person. They saw a change in him. So if you want some people, to, if you want people whom you're influencing to take them to Bethel and you want them to drop the excess baggage, you want them to drop the idols, you want, to drop the, you want them to drop their uncleanness, you want them to drop all that thing before you go to the place of Bethel, they will only do it when they see a change in you and me. Only a changed man, only a changed person who has an encounter at Bethel can influence others. Not only go to Bethel, but also to drop the strange gods. Not only go to Bethel, but to go through a change. Give the, look at what he says, earrings. At that point in time, they were all wearing physical earrings, men and women. It's, it was permitted. 
But these earrings at that point in time in those people, the people believe in today, those earrings were earrings of idol worship. They would take their deities or whatever the gods that they believed in and they put it over here with charms over it. Why? They would only put it, why? To keep the evil influence away. Evil eye, anything. They would just keep it here. He said, you are going to drop that idol thing. What did the Bible say? They gave their earrings. The earrings of today is the only difference. Right? Put, an H, put an H before that earring. It's time for us, if you're talking about going to Bethel, then it's time for you to put away those hearings. The hearings of the world. The hearings of the enemy. The voice. You need to drop it. When you're talking about going to Bethel, it's time that we shut our ears to the voice of what the enemy speaks or what they, or the world speaks. Am I communicating, church? It's time for us to, the Bible says what? They, it was gold and they just took it off. So it does not matter how precious it may sound to the ears. But if it is something that comes as an idol, is something that is against, drop the earrings. Look at somebody, drop the earrings. I'm not talking about the gold that you're wearing in your ears. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spiritual life. Hearing what you hear. Come on, are you with me? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. In the same scripture in John 10, it is what? My sheep do not know or recognize the voice of a stranger. They do not follow the voice of a stranger. That's what happens. He says what? Listen, it's not just, it is not accidental that they said, give your earrings. Because those guys also used to wear it in their hands, wear it in their legs, wear it around. But he said they gave their earrings. It's time to listen to the voice of God. Because in Bethel, you'll hear the voice of God. Before you go to Bethel, shut your ears to what it is. There. That's why so before they went, they removed it. Come on, are you with me, church? You cannot be going to the Bethel. You cannot be going to Bethel and say, God, I want to have an encounter. I want to listen to it. But at the same time, you have the earrings here also. Something that you just plugged in. Hallelujah. Bless somebody around you and say, drop your earrings. That's what happened here. They dropped their hearings. Go to verse number 5. And they journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities which was round about them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Oh, question mark. Who are they? He said, they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. He says, when they were on their move, when they were on their place to Bethel, when they were going for their own encounter, they, Jacob already had his. He was taking the other people around where the promise was renewed. While they were there, the Bible says, the terror of God, the dread of God, the fear of God rested upon the cities round about. And they did not pursue Jacob. Whose is they? Let me backtrack. Let me take you behind. One chapter behind. Don't open, I'll tell you. Now Jacob came to his place, native place, and dwelt there. Now when they dwelt there, he had wives, he had children, he had sons, he had daughters. And one of the daughters was Dina. Very pretty looking. The Bible says one day she took a stroll into the city to look around, things around, just familiarize herself and all that stuff. She went to that place. And then what happened there? She met a young man. And both looked at each other. It was like sort of love at first sight, whatever the, they, they may say. And the Bible says they, 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 they immediately had a relationship. And then what happened? The guy refused to leave Dina and kept her in a house, in his house. When this thing here reached the years of Jacob, he was very disturbed. He was very upset. But he could not do anything. He didn't have a voice. He didn't have the courage to go and confront. Listen, they took his own daughter. And the guy slept with his daughter. And he, he could not do anything about it. His sons had gone to the field. So he waited for them. So when they came home, they heard this thing. They were very upset. Very upset. Then these two guys, Simeon and Levi, they came with, up a, came with a plan. So let's, uh, before they came with the plan, the Bible says, the guy, Shechem, who took Dina, his father came to Jacob, Hamor. And he said, uh, listen, my son loves your daughter. My do your daughter loves my son. Why don't you give your daughter in marriage to my son and all that stuff? And then he pushed it further and he says, listen, why don't we make an agreement? Why don't you exchange your daughters for our sons and our daughters for your sons? Let's have some. You can exchange, he says. Jacob was not very happy with this, neither were the sons. 
for a moment, Simeon and Levi agreed and they said, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. But there was a cunning plan. They said, wait, we will do it. But only on one condition. He said, your men need to be circumcised. All your men need to be circumcised. Then only we will give our daughters in marriage and we will exchange your daughters for us. So it sounded nice to the ears. Hamor went and spoke to all the elders in the city, all the men in the, house, uh, in the city, and said, this is what it is. And the men immediately gave in their consent. They said, yes, we'll do it, no problem. What happened? They went and got circumcised. Third day is one of the most, uh, uh, what do you call it, very painful day after circumcision because it's not healing, it's, it's really hurting. It's not a comfortable situation. Circumcision is not makeup. You're not going to the parlor and doing makeup. Circumcision is pain. It's really painful. And that day is one of the most weakest day uh, for, for those people who go through circumcision. What did Simeon and Levi, Levi do? When they saw these people are weak, they went and killed all the males in the land. All of them, because they deceived him. Jacob was very, very, very upset. He was upset, more than upset, he was fearful. More than upset, he was very fearful. Go to chapter 34. He was more than upset, he was very, 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 very fearful. He had instant grip of fear in his heart. Go to verse number 30. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me odious or stinking among, or to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. I, being a few in number, and they gather themselves together against me, and do what? Slay me, and do what? Destroy me, and my house. Look at verse 31. Both the guys replied, and they said, should he, see what he said, should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? He said, how dare they take our sister and treat her like a prostitute? How dare, they said. How dare they touch our sister? Jacob almost like gave up. He said, he started rebuking his son instead of giving him an applause and giving him the pat and a great thing. No, he's saying, you did a stupid thing. Now all these guys will group together. I'm nobody, I'm just few. They'll swallow me and they'll swallow everything around here. By the way, what was the promise of God? To whichever place you go, I will be with you. Just like I was with Abraham. Just like I, I was with Isaac. I will be with you. He almost crumbed. He has come to pressure. And he began to say, no, no, I'm going to die. Oh, I'm going to be destroyed. Oh, I'm going to be finished. And, I'm going to... and he began to panic. His sons took the right decision. They said, no, no. That's real vengeance. They shouldn't have spoiled our sister in that way. That's where that verse number five came. What was the verse number five? In Bethel, that is protection. In, if, in, in Bethel, if there is promise, in Bethel, if there is purification, then in Bethel, there is also protection. What was the protection? He said, the terror of God will be upon the cities. Come on, am I making some sense, church? The terror of, the, the terror of God shall be upon the cities. And they said what? They will not pursue. He said, they will not pursue pursue you hallelujah blessed be the name of the Lord this is what happens in Bethel where God speaks and releases his promise this is what happens in Bethel where he protects you he, he sees you oversees you over that place hallelujah are you the church listen with Bethel comes God's protection he says the terror of God, the dread of God, the fear of God will rest upon not only just but on the cities. Go to that verse number five. Go to verse number five. What he says, and the terror of God, he says what, shall be upon the cities. Round about. And they will not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Wow, what a word that is. What a powerful word that is. That's why it is needful for us to take a journey to, to Bethel. It's needful for us to build ourselves in Bethel because in Bethel, God not only just gives a promise, but He renews the promise. He not only gives the promise, but He reminds us of the promise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you in the church? I would encourage you, stay in Bethel and have your not just one-time affair, one-time encounter, but many encounters in Bethel because the more you have encounters, the more He's going to speak. Hallelujah. I would encourage you. I would encourage you just stay in Bethel. While Gilgal talks about overcoming the flesh, Bethel talks about overcoming the world. You remember Abraham? He went down, got into the world. That's what 
Bethel will do. Because Bethel is a place where God will speak. That will enable to overcome the things of the world. You will not go down to Egypt for help. I'm not talking about the physical Egypt. Metaphorically speaking, spiritually speaking, is anything that Egypt concerns the world. You will not go down there to help, for help. In Jesus' name. You remember the next stop? Anybody remember the next stop? What was the next stop? Sorry, Jeraya? Jericho. <laughs> it sounded like Jeraya to me. He said what? He, he went from Gilgal to, to, to Bethel and then to where? Jericho. You remember Jericho where it, where it, how it started with? I made some references about Joshua. You remember about Joshua? They had crossed the river Jordan miraculously. Remember? The sea parted off. The sea parted off. Go to Joshua chapter 5. He says the sea parted off and they crossed over dry land to the other side to go to where? Jericho. Now before they went to Jericho, when they saw from far off, what happened? So listen, they were so close to the breakthrough. God had brought them to the place that he had promised, right? He brought them. We crossed over. Listen, they have just experienced an amazing miracle. The first generation experienced their miracle at, at the Red Sea. This new generation experienced their, their miracle at Jordan. The river parted off and they crossed over to their dry over the dry land to go to the place and about to touch. They can see it. They can feel it. They are so close. They are so close. They can see it with their physical eyes. Only to run into a wall. All along, 40 years, they have been walking, 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 walking. And now the realization of the promise has come. All they get is what? A big wall in their face. But while the wall is in their face, the Bible says, go to verse chapter, uh, Joshua chapter 5. Just make some reference. We're going to arise and pray. Verse number 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man against him over against him with the sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said unto him, Are you for us or for our enemies? Yeah? Verse number 14. And the answer was very encouraging. Just check it out. It was encouraging. He says, No. He asked a question, Are you for us or are you for the enemy or the adversaries? And the answer was what? No. But as a captain of the host, of the Lord, am I come now? Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said, What saith my Lord unto thy servant? Look at the answer. What was the answer? The answer was what? Straight no. The answer was what? I'm neither for you, neither for them. Are you with me, church? I'm neither for you. By the way, who was Joshua? Who was Joshua? The leader. Correct? He was a captain, right? He was the one who was leading the, from the front. He was the one who was the main project manager, whatever you want to call it. He was the number one guy. He was leading from that. Now he meets the, he meets the angel of the Lord, sword drawn in his hand, and he says, are you for us? Or for them? What did he say? No. For I am the captain. He said, I am the captain of the host from the Lord. I am the captain. So I'm not neither going to take sides. Listen, God is not taking sides. Here, what the, in the, the angel of the Lord was, I've not come to take your side or their side. I've not come to take sides. I've come to take over. Amen. He did not say, I've come, to ta I've, not, I've come to take sides. I'm going to be with you and I'm not going. To. No, no, no. He said what? I'm the captain. Look at the word he says what? You may be the captain. I don't want to come on your side. I am the captain. You bother on which side you are on. You should be more concerned which side you are going to be on. For I am the captain. I'm not going to come on your side because you're still the captain. But he says what? You make sure you come this side. It's up to you. It's your choice. Hallelujah. At Jericho you learn one thing. God doesn't take sides. At Jericho you, take, you come to know one lesson. God likes to take over. Listen, at Jericho you learn another lesson. He said what? Have you come for us or have you come for them? Are you come to help us or have you come to help? Listen, God is not just a helper. Listen, church, listen to this. God is not just a helper. He is the help. Amen. Listen, God does not just give breakthroughs. He is our breakthrough. 
He does not give breakthroughs. He does not give us a helping hand. He is the help. He comes to take over. What did he say in nice words? I'm the captain, I've come to take over, my friend. Joshua got the message loud and clear. What did he do? He fell on his feet and uh, fell on his face and worshiped. What does that mean? Surrender. At Jericho, when he said, God, I cannot handle it. And the Lord said, I'm neither for you, neither for them. No, I'm the captain. He immediately realized, surrender, Lord. Take it over. Take it all. Take it all. Take over the whole entire thing. Is God reminding somebody here on Jericho? He's knocking at the door right now. Don't say, Lord, are you for me or are you not for me? No, no, no. He says, I want to take over. He's the captain. Joshua was the captain of this place. The other guys were captain. But he said, I'm not going to take sides of the captain. But I'm a captain myself, he said. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Go to chapter 6. Verse number 2. Oh, okay, verse number one. He says, what? Jericho was securely shut. I'm going to finish up in just two, three minutes. Okay, just stay in, Just track with me for a couple of minutes. We'll finish up as soon as possible. And, jo and Jericho was securely shut because the children of Israel, none went out, none gave, because they're all scared of Israelites. Just, just saw the Jordan part. People walked on dry ground and crossed over. Bible says, they are, in other places, say their heart was sinking. They were fainting because of fear, because of Israelites. And because of these children, the Bible says, Jericho was so securely shut. The walls were so clearly, I mean, very strongly shut. Nobody could go out and nobody could come in. Look at verse number two. What did he say? See. Is that what he says in the Bible? See. The Lord said unto him, Joshua, see, I have given the land, Jericho, and its king, and the mighty men of valor. He said, what? Well, see. Listen, before you go and possess the promise or the promise gets realized, you need to see it first. You need to see your promises, how God sees. Are you with me, church? The next thing, the, 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 the uh, instruction was very clear. What was the instruction? For six days, for six days, you will march around the city. For six days, you will march around the city, the walled city, once in a day. You will march around. On the seventh day, you will march around the same city seven times. In total, how many times? Simple, six plus seven. It's not a trick question, man. It's a simple thing. Thirteen rounds. And he had set an order. The priest, the Ark of the Covenant, the trumpets, everything was in order. All they had to do was take rounds. Laps. Now, God gave this instruction, but Joshua said something additional. He told those people, when you are doing those rounds, you will not utter a word. You will not make any kind of noise. You will not shout. You will zip up your mouth. You will not speak. God didn't say that in the first place. He just said, you do the rounds. But Joshua, look at Joshua, because he was there in the first place. You remember Kadesh Barnea? When the spies were sent, they came back with lots of reports. Oh, good fruit, rich soil, and amazing produce and all that. But they also came with another report. Oh, those sons of Anak, they are giants. We are like grasshoppers. They began to open them. Remember? Only Joshua and Caleb said, no, let's go back. Let's go to that place. Joshua learned his lesson there. So when he was doing the laps, he told this guy, just shut up. I'm not ready to know the 40 years. Because last time they opened them out, they did 40 years. Are you with me, church? Last time they opened them out, 11-day journey became 40 years. So he told this time, I've come so close to my breakthrough, I'll make sure that nobody talks. Nobody opens their mouth. Because you open their mouth, we have to wait for another 40 years. You understood that? He came up and said, that was a strategy. Do not open your mouth. Listen, that's what you learn in Jericho. You may be doing the lap, first lap, nothing is moving, nothing is happening, no wind, no earthquake, no crack, nothing. Do your second lap quietly. At Jericho, you learn a lesson. Walk the walk of faith without uttering a word. Don't ask question. Why? The question, the, listen, the question, the, 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 the thing with that is what? When you're doing the laps, one thing you should remember. See, I've given Jericho in your hand. 
He said what? He has spoken it. He said, I will not keep quiet until I have performed what I have spoken. Are you with me, sir? Is that what God told Jacob? I will do those things which I have already spoken. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he a son of man that he should change his mind or repent. He told him, even before you go to that place and do your laps, I have given it to you. That's what promise is all about. Go, it's all yours. But you still need to do the laps. Look at somebody, you still need to do your laps. You can be saying yes and amen. Yes, I have the promise of God and sitting in one place. No, it's time for you to get up and do your laps. It's time that you get up and do your round of walk of faith around it. Around the promises, around the promises, around the promise. Do your laps around it. Do your laps. Listen, somebody may be in your last lap sitting here. Amen. Just do your last lap. Amen. Without uttering a word. Do not stop. Today could be your last. This could be your last season of doing your last 13th yes. lap. Just do it. Yes. Just do your 13th lap. And the Bible says what? They finished the lap and they raised a loud shout. Amen. When they raised a loud shout, listen, it was not, some people say, oh, Joshua and his people won the battle. Joshua and people did not win their battle. It was God. Amen. It was God who won the battle for them. All they did what? They did the laps. Listen, church, many a times God does not want us to do it. Just do the lap. Amen. Just do the lap. Just do your faith lap. Just do your faith walk. Just keep it. Listen, even if nothing is moving, just do your faith walk. Amen. That's what Jericho is all about. We walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. They shall walk by faith. Last word. The Bible says, the walls came down flat. Everything came down, shook up and came down flat. Go to the last verse. Go to verse number 20. And what happened? And the people shouted out and the priests blew their trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall of that the wall fell down flat. So the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And verse 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both men and women, old and young, uh, ox and sheep and uh, the ass, the donkeys, with the edge of the sword. Is that what it says in the Bible? They took over the adversaries. Remember that question? Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? When God brought the walls down flat, what did the people do? Oh, walls have come down. No, no. That's the time to take up your sword and go inside. Destroy the works of darkness. Destroy. Listen, if Gilgal is talking about overcoming the flesh, if Bethel is talking about overcoming the world, then Jericho is certainly talking about overcoming the works of darkness, overcoming Satan, overcoming the power of the devil. Am I making some sense, church? What did the Bible say? The Bible says everybody went, took their sword and finished off. Men, women, young, old, ox, everything that pertained to that adversary, they finished off and they took all the gold and the silver and the spoils, brought it into the storehouse. But listen, in the midst of their adversary, in the midst of the enemy, there was somebody who was locked. You remember this harlot, Rahab? Joshua said, go to her house. Those two spies whom she hit, he sent them only. Go to Rahab's house. Bring her safely out. It was not just her. She said, all that were associated with her household. Read the scripture very well. All that were associated with Rahab, all was brought safely outside. Listen church. If God is taking you through a Jericho situation, when God is giving you the power to overpower the works of darkness, don't forget to release Rahab. Bring her out. Listen, God shows a harlot. God, I see a glimpse of grace here. The grace of God fell upon a prostitute, my friend. In the midst of Jericho, in the midst, what is Jericho? It's cursed. In the midst of a curse, there is somebody who is locked does not know how to come out. When God enables you to overpower the works of darkness, don't take the gold and the silver, run away. Wait, there is a harlot there. Harlot, in other words, prostitute, in other words, somebody who is unworthy. Somebody who looked down and he said what? Useless. When you look at, some, when you look at that harlot and say, man, that is, that is a dirty thing. Oh man, we were also dirty in the same place once upon a time. We also belong to that place once upon a time. But the grace of God fell on us. 
Are you with me, church? In the midst of walking into your promises, in the midst of walking into your breakthrough, in the midst of walking into your promised land, what God gave you, look for the Rahabs. Now, it was not just Rahab who was rescued. Everybody, look at it. What does the New Testament say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, and your household. Fulfillment, I see grace there. Not only Rahab was saved. Rahab showed mercy on those uh, spies. But when the time came for deliverance, everybody was saved either. Hallelujah. Are you with me, church? Listen, when you go through Jericho, look for the Rahabs. Look for the people who are associated with ones who see, who the, uh, whom the system or the, or the society may say, you are dirty, you are filthy, you are useless. Look for such people because that's what happens in Jericho. You find the harlots over there. You find the ones who are ready to change their heart and say, I will follow God. This Rahab wrote her name in the lineage of Jesus. She wrote her name in the Hall of Fame. You remember Hebrews chapter 11, Hall of Fame chapter? She wrote her name there. Hallelujah. When that story was written about that harlot, it was not written about her past. Come on, let's rise and pray.